Corporate finance practice problem using OneNote. Retained earnings and dividend limits. Get ready. It's time to take our chance with corporate finance. Here we are in OneNote. If you have access to OneNote, would like to follow along. You're not required to, but if we'd like to, we're in the icon on the left-hand side in the practice problems tab. Then down in the 1816 retained earnings and dividend limits tab. Also note when using OneNote, look at the immersive reader tool. Our presentations will be down in the text area as well. Same name, same number, but with transcripts. Transcripts that can be translated into multiple different languages and either listened to or read in them. Closing the icon, we have our information up top, calculations then on down below. We're looking at the dividend limits, both in terms of what is kind of like the legal limit for the dividends and why that might be the case, and then what would be the practical limit for dividends, as well as kind of a dividend policy type of limit that might be put in place. As we take a look at these, remember when we're thinking about the dividends, we're thinking about the money that is being paid out of the company to the owner. So if you think about that as similar to a sole proprietorship or partnership, from the standpoint of a sole proprietorship or a partnership, each partner, each owner then, might have a different amount that might be distributed to them in accordance with their personal capital account. However, when you're looking at a corporation, of course, one of the benefits of the corporation are that we have this standardization of these kind of units of ownership, which are going to be the stocks, and that's going to result in some differences in terms of how the policy for distributing the earnings back, which would be called like draws, for a partnership or a sole proprietorship is different for a corporation. The corporation then having the dividends that have to be agreed on, and you kind of have to have the standardization of the dividends that will be distributed to each of the equivalent units in order to keep those equivalent units basically, you know, equivalent. So if we have the information on the left-hand side, we're, gonna, we're looking, we're concentrating in on, we're thinking about the equity section basically of the balance sheet. So assets minus liabilities equals the equity section, meaning the kind of the owner's claim to the assets of the business as opposed to debtors or liabilities claim to the assets of the business, which you can think of in aggregate. And you can also think of it basically as a per unit basis. And then how much of that is going to be distributed out the owner's claim equity, how much of that equity is distributed out and how could it be distributed out to the owners in the form of dividends. So if we look at this example, we got the stockholders equity at the 162,000. Let's imagine that's the full stockholders equity. And remember when you're thinking about equity in general, you can kind of think of it as the same as if you're thinking about a sole proprietorship, a partnership or a corporation. It's the net value assets minus liability or owner's claim as a total. Then the confusion comes into play with the breaking out of that amongst the owners, which for a corporation, once again, is done with standard units, those being the common stocks. Then we have the common stocks, and we're imagining this is kind of like part of the equity section. So if these are the two components of the equity section, we have the total stockholders equity, which consists in part of the common stock. The common stock is basically what has been issued uh, to, this, to the stockholders, and they have received money for it. And again, you can think of that as similar to a sole proprietorship or a partnership that makes an initial investment into the sole proprietorship or partnership. That's the money that they put in as opposed to the money that has been generated from the company uh, or the business in that case and still accumulates in earnings. With a corporation, you have the similar situation. When the corporation issues the stock, they're receiving money from basically the owners, the owners of the corporation, and that's kind of like the investment, of course, of the capital from the owners into the business. So it's still part of equity, which represents the owner's claim to the assets. But we break it out separately in a corporation because we want to differentiate the amount of the equity section that is basically the owner's investment, which is a result of the stock purchase from the corporation itself, not the stock purchases amongst on the secondary market, because it'll trade on the secondary market, but the money that went from an investor to the corporation is representing as an investment of the owner. Again, it doesn't necessarily need to be the current owner of the stock because they could have bought it from the corporation and then sold it and so on, but it still represents basically investments of the owners of the stockholders as opposed to the retained earnings, which is what it is. it sounds like, the earnings of the corporation that have been retained, meaning they haven't been distributed, distributed in the form of dividends to the owners of the corporation 
which would be similar to draws if you're talking about a sole proprietorship or partnership. Okay, so now that we <laughs> let's take a look at this. We're going to say then if the total equity is the 160, 162,000 and the common stock, we're going to say 64, and we subtract that out, I'm going to say the retained earnings then part of, in essence, the balance sheet is going to be 98,000. We're going to say that the total assets are 405,000 of the company on the balance sheet and 12% of it is cash. So 405, if we take the 405,000 times the 0 0.12, that's going to give us 48,600 of cash. We're going to say that the earnings included in retained earnings, so these are the earnings for the year on the income statement, you're imagining net income, bottom line of the income statement, are at the 26,000. That 26,000 is telling us the story about basically what happened last year for the amount that's on the balance sheet, meaning the balance sheet is us at the end of the time period. Income statement is a time frame beginning to end, and this is basically this 26,000 would then be part of the retained earnings at the end of the day. Now, normally, when you think about the dividends that would be distributed, you typically think of them as some percentage of, of the uh, earnings that would happen, the earnings that have happened during the period, some percentage of them would, would be distributed, you would think, and the other percent would be basically retained in the company and included in the retained earnings. However, you're not really limited to the 26000 in this case, that you earned last year. Last year's earnings are not the, the limit. They might be the, the thing that most companies will base on, but the, the real limit is going to be basically what's in the retained earnings. So the dividend limit that we can think about is going to be the stockholder's equity, in our, in our case, minus the common stock, or in other words, the retained uh, earnings, the, the 98000 the 98000 So from a, like a legal standpoint, generally, uh, you, can, you, can, you can go over the top of the earnings in the current year and keep on distributing out. And that might even happen if you have a situation where, where say, they forego dividends one year or something like that for growth and you've got earnings and then maybe you have a down year or something and they still want to give dividends that are in compliance with their plan and they and they basically still give dividends possibly over the current year earnings or something like that they can do that because the current year earnings are only one year back and they had been accumulating earnings that they had not yet distributed out in prior years that have been accumulating upwards so this retained earnings once again represents the earnings over the life, not just last year, that have accumulated that has not yet been distributed out. The dividends are usually based on the current year earnings, meaning they don't, they're not usually over the current year earnings, but they could be, and they could generally be as high as, as whatever the retained earnings is from a legal standpoint. If they go beyond that, they might you might say, well, why can't they keep going? Because they still have 64000 of original investment, which represents the owner's ownership of the assets why can't they keep going past that they they kind of could if they were to liquidate but that would be more of a kind of a liquidation type of process because this 64,000 represents the investment that would be returned to the owners as opposed to earnings and when you think about that and add the complexity of taxes that would be involved in on that you have a different tax impact there right there's a different tax impact if you're talking about dividends earnings versus if you're talking about the common stock that's being distributed back so th that might happen in some cases where you uh, go into the common stock but that would be my maybe a, a liquidating type of distribution that might have a different treatment so generally the limit from a legal limit is the ninety-eight thousand. now what about a practical limit so you might say okay well what if we wanted to give this this amount of the 98 of the ninety-eight thousand? Well, we, there could be a situation where you say, yeah, we could do that because we can go as high as we want on the retained earnings, but we can't do that actually for cash dividends because we only have, as we saw, cash of the 405,000 times the 12% or the 48.6, I believe it was, one more time, 405,000 times the 0.12. So if we only got cash of 48,600 and we're talking about cash dividends, either we sell something or we're limited to, you know, the cash dividends, which would be limited to cash of the 48.6. So from a practical standpoint, that, of course, would be a limit. Now, you might be saying, how come, you know, we're limited to that, even though we got the assets of the 405,000? Remember that from a balance sheet standpoint, everything we have on the books, including equipment, fixed assets and whatnot, is valued in terms of dollars. But you know, they're not liquid. We can't, we'd have to sell them in order to get the dollars in order to pay out a higher dividend. And the whole point 
of the business in and of itself is that we got capital in order to invest in things like equipment, factories, buildings, and whatnot, so that we can generate the profit. So, so we, you know, that, that's going to be a practical limitation that we have. How much cash flow do we actually have to, to give out the dividends? That's going to be a practical limitation that uh, will differ from different types of companies. If it's a startup company, usually they're going to be tighter on cash because they're trying to get more cash to buy more stuff to increase their earnings. Once you've leveled off and you're in a mature state, then it might be of the, of the business cycle, a mature point in the business cycle, you might be in a situation where you can have more steady cash and, at, at that point in time. So, and then we also have the, the payout reason, ratio using the practical point. So if we use this cash of the 48.6 and imagine that's how much we pay out in dividends, dividends of the 48.6 will imagine compared to the earnings of the 26,000. And we look at that ratio, we got the 48.6 divided by the 26,000. Now that, once again, if we move the decimal two places over, is 186.92. Looks a little funny because it's, you know, it's higher that the dividend payout ratio you would expect to be some ratio of the current year earnings, which are the 26,000 in this case. In other words, net income is how we did last year. You would expect then that the payment for the dividends would be some proportion of the earnings that we made last year and usually it is that's usually how they'll it'll be reflected so this will usually be less than 100 percent but doesn't necessarily have to be that way and you could imagine unusual situations incomes low perhaps but they had good years in the past and want to give the same dividends so remember that the, our 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 limit then to just to recap this is from a legal standpoint you can't really go over the retained earnings otherwise it's something other than you know a normal type of dividend the practical limit is the cash. So if you got the cash, uh, you, you can go up to the cash, which is usually not going to be as high as the uh, retained earnings limit generally. And usually it's going to be some percentage of the income, which which may or may not be, you know, less high or less than the cash uh, number. But it doesn't necessarily have to be limited to the income uh, if, if you have the cash flow in order to in order to go over that and you have enough retained earnings from prior years to to dip into the prior year retained earnings.